Hello. That's your signal to sit down. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How's it going? Have a good first day? Thumbs up? Good. Glad to hear it. Uh, I'm glad to see you all. My name is David Simpson. I'm the program director here at the Fine Arts Work Center. My pronouns are he, him, his. It's a pleasure to see all of your smiling faces. I'm glad to see you here. We have a great lineup tonight. We have, a, we have a great lineup every night this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So we do these faculty talks every week. And I hope if you're not here with us as a student that you will come back tomorrow and Tuesday. You won't be sorry you did. Tonight, we get to hear from poet Nathan McLean. <laughs> and visual artist and writer Mark Adams. Oh, here come the stragglers. No, I'm just kidding. Come on in. You're right on time. <laughs> um, before we begin, though, a little bit of housekeeping, other moments of in uh, items of interest. The common room, where we are right now, is going to be closed this week, Friday through Sunday. We're doing a private thing. Poetry in America is coming here to record interviews with several of the poets that are here this week. So this will be off limits for, for you Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You'll be gone by then anyway. But just to say, if you want to look at the exhibit or get books or merchandise, do it before Friday because you won't have a chance to do so on Friday. So just to, and I'll say this again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So hopefully at some point you'll, um, it'll sink in. Anyway, uh, Nathan and Mark's books will be for sale at the back of the book, uh, back of the uh, back of the room, and they will be signing their books after, right? signing their books after the event, so I encourage you to go back and take a look. Also take a look at our bookstore that's in the gallery, because you'll we have a bunch of books from cu current and former faculty. And while you're back there, check out the exhibit that's uh, up right now. It's called Everyone We Know Is Here. It's a fantastic summer exhibition curated by former Falk fellow Heidi Hahn. And it consists of 20 or so former Falk fellows, and it's a wonderful show, really gorgeous. So you should check it out if you haven't already. Uh, what else? <laughs> Big shout out to East End Books for managing our bookstore. <laughs> and also while we're in applause mode, a big hand to Cape Cod Five Savings Bank for their generous support of our public programming this summer. <laughs> what else? Restrooms are down the hall on the left if you need them. The, the sign up sheet for Student night is on that table right there, and I notice that the first page is almost filled. I, it's full now. A big hand of applause for you. It's, it's great because I will tell you, every other week before this week, that's eight weeks privacy, there were no people signed up yet on Monday night. Not a single person. And I had to berate people publicly. So now I don't have to do that. So good job on that. Um, if you haven't yet, I encourage you to do so because uh, you won't be sorry. Uh, this is like the most loving, embracing crowd you're going to get, and you'll really be glad that you read. Um, so please do consider it if you haven't already. And finally, please do us all a favor and turn your cell phones to silent, um, really, so that we c everyone gets the f our full attention. So let's get started. I first met Nathan McLean about a year ago when he read at our first Falk Friday event last November. Before he even got to the podium, I was struck by the introduction given for him by John Murillo, who's a two-time Falk fellow, also an incredible poet. If you haven't checked him out, you definitely should, and one of my favorite all-time human beings. His introduction was full of praise and wonder for Nathan's poetry and admiration of Nathan as a generous and kind human being. In my mind, anyone worthy of such praise by a, by a person I admire as much as I do John was worthy of my attention, so I zoned in as, jo as Nathan took the stage. And as soon as Nathan started to read, I nodded to myself thinking John was absolutely right. Nathan's poems are rooted in place in a way that's utterly personal and specific. They are rooted in nature, but in a way that feels mythic, like a fable. And they are rooted in history, but in a way that talks directly to us today and challenges us directly today. His poems are lush with longing, 
sharp with provocation, beautiful to read, and beautiful to listen to. Poet Nathan McLean was born and raised in the desert of, a southern, of southern California. He earned his MFA from Warren Wilson's MFA program for writers. He has published two poetry collections, Scale and Previously Owned, both from Four Way Books. His poems have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Poem A Day, The Common, and The Rumpus, among many others. He has been honored with fellowships from the Suwannee Writers Conference, the Frost Place, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and Cavi Canham. He currently teaches at Hampshire College, and he is poetry editor of the Massachusetts Review. <coughs> Will you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Nathan McLean. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to David for that wonderfully kind uh, introduction. Thank you to, oh, I hear Zora. She's found me. She's found me, um, as she will. And uh, certainly thank you to David uh, for the invitation to be here for the summer writing program. It's uh, really wonderful to be here with this wonderful attendance of participants and really fantastic and talented artists and writers. Um, it's a real treat to be here at this time. Um, and you'll, you'll hear some protests that'll be going on. <laughs> she upstaged me the last time that we were here. She upstaged me every time we're anywhere, but, um, but thank you all for, for being here and thank you to Sarah for all the logistical things. I'm really looking forward to being in conversation with, with Mark tonight. Um, we'll start with uh, a poem entitled Now that I live in this part of the country. And I, I, I thinking about sort of like Mark's work, I figured we'll, we'll stay in the natural world. Now that I live in this part of the country, the fireflies are far more abundant. A word I thought I'd never use again. And someone says, how beautiful, which I could forgive. And someone says, look, they flash the way hazard lights sometimes flash. And I might have said, no, don't they seem to pulse with the glow of old grievances? But then, no one really asked me. The world is full. I saw the wolf outside the window, in the backyard, near the park bench, nearly stripped of all its paint. Or I thought it was a wolf I saw, insomuch as I even called wolf, wolf, through every room of the farmhouse, it was quite the spectacle. False alarm, one might say, as if explanation were a kind of comfort, I, was not comforted. My panic startled me, the white way one can be startled by something he's read in a book he's forgotten he owns, that he can't in the slightest remember buying while thumbing over the other spines, all those titles huddled there, to, there on the shelves. Out of nowhere, we say in these cases, where did this come from? How had I missed this? The wolf seemed to come out of nowhere. Or maybe from a book I remember read to me as a child. Some cautionary tale. A window capable of being looked in, seen through, if you were brave. It was not a wolf outside the window. It was a coyote. But with the wolf's bulk, its metallic flash of fur, its appetite. I admit, I was afraid, not for myself, but for the chickens. I looked out the window because the chickens clucked so madly, like children at a school running amok. The hens flapped at the glass, the chicks instinctively slipped out of sight into the taller wet grass. No, it was not a wolf. Of course, I knew the difference. I had been a boy, 
been small enough to be clenched in a wolf's jaw, though I never was. I was safe. I wanted to save them, but the commercial in the background insisted the window for savings was closing fast, then faded to black, as they do when they're done. The wolf scattered them, the way feathers can be scattered, torn from the body, or the way children are drilled, even in grade school, to scatter. Shh. We prepared for this now. I called Wolf. I clapped at the glass, which I've been told makes a difference, and I wanted things to be different. To the chickens, it must have looked as if I took delight in their predicament, and who would tell them otherwise? The world is full of suffering, it's true. Why not delight in that it's yours, not mine, for once? The coyote slunk away, or the wolf did, something dead, I thought, between its teeth. I was afraid, though I went out to look for what was missing, what was lost to the woods. Ten chickens, two chicks, I counted them, like I tally all loss, scattered the way one might scatter bird seed in the yard, or how one might scatter a child's ashes to the ocean's indifference. I'd been a boy, lost among the woods as in some fable, or maybe not lost, just the shade of tree bark. Not a wolf, though to the chickens, the distinction hardly matters. Here, chicky chicky. No one had bothered to name them. To name them, we believed, would make them harder to kill and eat, but how wrong we were. I believed I could save them, or that saving them meant I loved them, that my love was good for something. And because we're here at the Fine Arts Work Center, I was telling some of the participants in my workshop that if there's any place that you're gonna share work that's still sort of like in progress and in process, I, I figured this was a, a, one of the most uh, supportive and, and beneficial places to, to share that work. And so I'm gonna read a couple of things, that, a couple of poems that I'm still in the midst of figuring out, um, but that are, I'm, I'm finding I'm just staying sort of in the garden, it seems. Um, and, uh, and just f also for your, your knowledge, no chickens were harmed in the making of that poem. Um, <laughs> this next poem is entitled, Because of History. Because of history, I thought I might only feel one way about working a piece of land, even as we now have a small plot of land to work, me and my wife. I can tell I've been working because my lower back hurts, but that could also be from bending improperly or perhaps the price of getting old. I say we have, but my plot is a rented plot, the way one might rent an apartment, a car, borrow a library book. No one had tilled the plot before me, so the ground was often as hard as the tending itself, which required breaking. Climbing along the cattle panels, I curved between T-posts are long beans, cucumber, black futsu squash, and tomato, among other plants, more than enough. In a nearby plot, a child might be seen, clearing weeds or tipping a watering can. With all these children, birds, rabbits, and plants, one might think my plot its own ecosystem, to be sustained 
and kept. So I gave it water. I hack back weeds, pushing up like stalks of corn, though should it be left to me, deciding what should live there, if not the slow opening marigolds or dandelion greens? Because my plot is rented, in October, we will collapse the cattle panels, the tea cinder block, tea post, and wooden stakes the way any government or kingdom under the right oversight can be collapsed and put away. Just look how easily it all comes down, like the last set pieces of a stage play, the half moon, cardboard cloud and stars, a handful of leaves, the small section of picket fence. And this is probably the, the, the most new uh, of the poems um, that I've, I'm bringing in. We recently, my wife and I, because it's a thing you do in Western Mass, I guess, um, took my daughter raspberry picking, um, which I had, had never done before. And um, yeah, it's hard to be out there with like a little kid and not think about like the history of the country, like while this kid is just like stuffing their face with raspberries. But uh, this poem I'm calling, Then I Took My Black Ass Raspberry Picking. <laughs> Then I took my black ass raspberry picking, because why not? It was summer, and what else to do with children in Western Mass? Plus, my daughter loves raspberries, especially the one inside my wife's elbow. Though to lift it might take all the ingenuity she can muster, so much she has yet to understand. So yes, I went, or went along at least. The raspberry bushes farther off in the field, back, back, back by the big trees, the owner told us, where shadow seemed to gather almost as though it had something planned. Though who could say what? Clear plastic tubs the owner handed us for picking. From possibly a hundred years ago, the farm in her family's hand, the way any history could be held, kept. How long have they fastened rope to these tubs? I wondered. You could wear them like a yoke if you needed your hands free. If you want, she said. Don't worry, we'd never let our daughter wear this thing around her neck like some animal. And here is where I should say we didn't wear it either, my wife, me, but we did. I hate to admit it was easier to just wear them while we picked, but of course it was. I'm just going to read just a couple more poems from, uh, from the book. And incredibly grateful to read for this room this evening. Midlife Obad. There's a certain comfort in knowing a bridge has stood almost forever. There before, long before the dawn's first foghorn blast, like one beast lowing to another. And before each ship, I could describe now with painstaking precision that will glide slowly underneath. Steel, suspension wire, something in my life should compare to these. Once there was a bridge whose name I never learned under which a small stream shimmered, the way a pond sometimes shimmers for a moment when a child flips a coin into it. Tiny fish swam there, but the water was like smoke. I thought nothing should have to live like this. 
And I'll close with a poem um, that's entitled The Ferry, and that's F-E-R-R-Y, the, the ferry, the boat. Um, and I figured since we're here in Massachusetts, yeah, I figured I have to clarify this, right? Um, that, uh, yeah, I figured we're in Massachusetts, and uh, this was a time when I was sort of moving from um, sort of the Boston Ferry to, or the, the Woods Hole Ferry to Martha's Vineyard. Um, and this is what sort of grew out of that. And thank you all again for your, your attention. The Ferry. I still had a lover. Maybe let's start there. I hitched a ride to Boston where I missed the ferry by what seemed like minutes. But time can work that way in the mind. I was in love or wanted to be in love and there was distance everywhere is maybe a better way to put it. Though, what exactly was it? I hadn't given it a designation. I looked for the boat. It wasn't there. Only the dock, a few seagulls, a blue distance. If I was supposed to wave goodbye, I missed my chance. Though, what did I care? So in love with solitude, at least I was at the time. It seemed easy, being lonely, watching time lapse, that boat long dispatched. I'd missed it, yet there I was, waving like a fool in love, perhaps, at what? I couldn't tell. I wasn't there when the ferry left, remember? I missed it or they went on without me. The distance made it hard to see clearly where distance ended, or if it did. Or I didn't make it in time to see. Maybe time was against me. I missed the ferry. I had no money. The ferryman said it was fine and smiled at me, smiled. There was the shore and me wanting to be in love, though I wasn't. I carried what I could. Love, I didn't have room for it. In the distance, I swore my solitude waved. I missed it where I was headed, sure, but there was hardly time for that. The boat was early. I boarded it and stood on the stern. Part of me was missing but there had to be a cost. That part I missed, my mind a rough sea I might have loved watching lap were I not so inside it, my mind the fish too, the shore distant as the voice I thought I heard in it, as time itself. The ferry was late, I was there, hoping I missed it. I didn't trust the distance, lovely as it seemed. I didn't trust time, nor where it carried me. I knew what was there. Thank you very much. Wait, more, more, more applause for Nathan McLean. <laughs> and now we're going to hear from Mark Adams. And to introduce Mark, I'd like to invite one of his students, Claudia Alum. Alum, Alum. You know who I'm talking about. To the stage. Thank you. Claudia, come on up here. Hi. It's only 30 seconds, but I rewrote it about 500 times. <laughs> the plight of a writer. Hello, I'm Claudia Alum, and it's a pleasure for me to be up here to introduce my teacher, Mark Adams. I'm one of his students in the Thoreau on the Beach plein air art class. Confession, I have not done an art project since middle school. 
It's only been one day so far, but the kid in me is already wildly unleashed, while the writer is thinking, wow, who knows what interesting connections this is going to spark in my writing. Uh, class today was a multi-sensory experience, so much more than simply putting brush or pen to paper, as I thought it would be. And that's because of the many layers and perspectives that Mark brings to his art and his writing and his teaching, cultural, emotional, scientific, visual, sensory. He's traveled with a sketchbook in Asia, Central America, and Europe, and oh, how envious I am. He was a cartographer for 25 years with the National Park Service and illustrated and co-authored a geologic primer, Coastal Landforms of Cape Cod, who knew that we had geologic primers. In 2017, the Provincetown Art Association Museum showed a retrospective of his work called Expedition, a title that seems particularly apt to me for an artist and writer whose work, as the Schoolhouse Gallery has said, harvests curiosity, wonderment, and a little biology. One of my friends here this week who's taking Mark's class with me, but she's taking it for the second time, she nailed it when she said that Mark makes art look e easy, accessible, and organic. He promotes the idea that you can make art anywhere and that you should. So thank you, and now to our teacher, Mark. Well, I don't think I want to say anything after that. And I think <laughs> that's enough. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm very, very appreciative to be here. This is such an amazing community to, to be part of. It's cool to read with Nathan. Um, thanks, David and Sarah and all the staff um, and for uh, my students and friends for being here. Um, let's see. I, um, I, Nick, do you want to help me? Um, could you just, uh, I just want to see some slides here. So, could you see, uh, is this working? Can you turn it around? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the boring ones you can give as long as you want. If you, you know, whatever you want to do, you can just keep running. And what I'm going to do, actually, okay, so the first few slides are kind of examples from the class, from previous classes. And uh, what we do is t drag the sketchbook out to places in town and, um, and we, uh, <laughs> well, uh, actually, I'll give you the, the trigger warning to keep to go, yeah. But, um, you know, we start with drawing our hands and then we get out into the landscape and try to put it all together. Um, let's see. And then we write. Uh, we write based on prompts that are in front of us uh, or from, from Thoreau or other writers. Uh, one of the, the themes that I'm working on is uh, first to observe the landscape and then to see not just what we see, but also the processes of nature, the processes of ge geology and change. But then w one thing I'm really interested in now is there's a cultural layer. And how do we bring that cultural narrative to the landscape? Uh, that's something I'm going to try and show some examples of. Uh, Thoreau, when he came here um, in the 1850s, uh, there's some interesting coincidences in history. He had a great interest in indigenous uh, culture in uh, the Wampanoag people. And that was a moment in time when the last native speakers of, Wamp of the Wampanoag language were around. And he had this project to try and capture some of that language. How did they refer to plants and animals? Unfortunately, he never completed that project. And the only reason that the language survives now is because of a translation of the Bible into Wampanoag, and the, fortunately there is a, a, a language uh, restoration project on the Cape, and the children tri of the tribal members get that education, but the thing that's left out of the Bible is, is what are the names of the things that are here? That's not in the Bible. You know, what are the names for beach grass and for uh, 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 the snapping turtles and uh, the, the the, you know, so where's that indigenous knowledge? And uh, so I'm a kind of on a quest for that. But uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so let's see. 
So yeah, these are just uh, some images from the marshes in, uh, and uh, places that we go on our journeys this week. I was going to try and re read from these, but I actually I'm not going to try it because it's on the screen. But let's go through the, these um, relatively quickly. There's about half a dozen of these sketchbook pages. We're using walnut ink. We're using uh, kind of a blind contour method to capture the landscape quickly in a place that might not be super comfortable. Keep going. Uh, also some watercolor. Uh, you can kind of read some of this. I owe a lot to Nick Flynn and, and our writing group. Some of the members are here in uh, how to use prompts to uh, kind of motivate writing uh, on the spot. Keep going. Uh, and uh, yeah, keep going. And then, uh, yeah, sometimes there's weather, there's nature, there's raindrops. Um, and uh, sometimes it's for fortuitous. <laughs> uh, keep going. Uh, that was a, that's a repeat. These are all kind of on the shoreline of Provincetown, but what I want to get through these and go to uh, something else, um, which I want to spend a little more time on. And hopefully, this is an experiment. It's going to be a little scrappy. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, keep. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, keep going. Okay, stop. So I have a whole uh, sketchbook here that tells a story of a journey to uh, an island, in a Greek island called Lesbos. And um, I went there a few times to volunteer with refugees, and I used these books as a way of recording uh, the journey. The place we went to is on the coast of Greece. Um, let's see. And so I'm just going to read a few selections from the sketchbook uh, you know, there's this feeling of landing on an island. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. The familiar scarp crescent of Lesbos, green to its clipped edges below. I'm intensely curious ab about what waits. These big Aegean prop planes lurch like old trucks. The flight service offers a mint from a bowl. Below, a coastal road at the edge of the cliffs winds into a river valley. Switchbacks on ridges and the outcrops nosedive to the waterline. Uh, a b an island big enough to lose your way, daunting to walk, each little ravine a small world, and there is Turkey, a stone's throw, the same rock, the same villages, but not quite. Uh, and uh, that's because many of the people, so let's go ahead. So now you can just kind of go. Um, the sea is full of Grecian blue and general peacefulness. Last night wandering, I followed groups of proper ladies and middle-aged hippies into the town theater, not knowing what could transpire. Uh, a, a concert seemed likely, a choir battle of the bands, almost an, uh, who imagined a small town had so many amateur choirs with different gowns and sashes, children clapping. Uh, I didn't understand a word. Um, the next, um, so this is the first morning at a place called One Happy Family, which is a day center for refugees, mostly uh, Syrian, Afghan, Iraqi, uh, some African. Um, so there's, let's see, after cleaning and orientation, there's some caution about attachments. Uh, Jan and I bust lunch bowls by the hundred and I have playground duty, then English conversation with Alam. He's very advanced. We talk about cliches and family, which is a minefield. Uh, El Aid and the quiet life of Herat, smoking in cafes. In the playground, I teach three-year-olds to make sand towers. One, one lad hugs, peeking around the gate, and erupts in delight when I encourage him in. His father later gestures that he is his baby and shouldn't be getting dirty. His white shirt remains spotless, as far as I could tell. Uh, and then a sudden alarm of screams pointing into the sandbox and I rescue a spider and the children resume, calm is restored. Supervising toddlers in a refugee camp is terrifying. <laughs> um, when you imagine what they've been through to get there and, that, and the dangers of everyday play for kids that are um, possibly manic, that are you know, suffering from stress, uh, 
Uh, shuttling back to town in the van, my seatmate tells me he's been here for two months after traveling two years in Iran and some weeks in Turkey. In Iran, he hid in a basement most of the time. He married his wife there and decided to journey on with her sister. They are all cousins. Do you like Greece? No, we don't, but it's very much better here, and Afghanistan is impossible. There's no return. Uh, I meet a, a Syrian portrait artist, a Kurd, with three years of uh, law school. Uh, uh, I realize that the news is always a general gloss on the individual, the individual experience. On the way, I, had, I sold a drawing in Provincetown so I could buy basketballs to bring along for the, for the, uh, the playground at the center. Um, some of these, uh, see, this is the, the walk, the, the morning walk to the refugee center. Uh, and the next one is uh, one of the notorious or, or one of the most lovable members of the refugee community who had failed in his asylum request many times. He had no way forward at all, but he was one of the most generous and kind and the life of the party. And the Afghans love to dance. And it's usually something that the men do. Uh, the women sit in the back. The European women will dance with the Af Afghan men. Uh, but the men dance with each other. Um, let's see. Why did you leave your country? Well, it's a cemetery sea out there. And the refugees are counseled uh, to stick to two strict reasons for leaving. There's a, there's a training program with lawyers of how to get through the asylum process. And uh, the magistrates who hear the asylum uh, uh, hearings generally try their best to trip up anyone requesting asylum and find flaws in their story and dismiss them or reject their asylum claim because uh, they're inconsistent. So if you don't remember the exact moment you left, the exact journey you, you went on, if you don't tell the story the same way every single time, then you're suspicious and you're a poser and uh, you get basically get rejected. There's a, the, si the asylum process basically takes a couple of years in which you stay in a camp and, um, and you get stamps on your pad every time you get a hearing. Uh, the one of the most frustrating things is that success for an asylum seeker is to basically move on to a kind of a, a container life in Germany. And wh what you left behind in Afghanistan is uh, um, this rich community with uh, family and friends. And um, as you move on, you trade uh, security and safety um, for security and safety uh, you trade for this life of uh, kind of a sterile life where the, you learn a new language, you, your, your profession's not recognized, um, you basically start over. Um, let's see. Several of my fellow volunteers work at, on night shifts spotting for smugglers' boats landing refugees. The shifts are midnight to 4 a.m. and then 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Just like the Cape Cod lifesavers of the 1800s, they start in the middle and work the shoreline north and south, slowly scanning for flashlights on the nearly invisible dinghies. Each, hold, each, each, uh, each dinghy holds 30 to 60 tired, wet, scared migrants with little awareness of what might greet them. Uh, either the Turkish Coast Guard turning them back or the Greeks and NGOs helping, helping them. But volunteers must bring in the police immediately. If a volunteer helps a boat ashore, then the volunteer themselves gets, uh, can be charged with trafficking. Uh, this, is th this, all of this, uh, this whole journey, this whole um, story is a couple of years old now and things are a bit different, in some cases worse. Uh, Friday, I pick up lunch plates, and I s suddenly see the, the playground is open in open revolt. At least two kids are face down crying, and the fight's in the sandbox. Uh, uh, security and helpers, parents are mobilized, and for a moment, my authority is nil. <laughs> so 
you know, you need to use, there's no language, there's no language that we share in common except for the gestures. Um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a value in the mock battles and the destruction that happens in the playground. The smile, the, the play is important. The smile, the adult gaze of approval, anything to light up these children in stress. Uh, So on a trip out of town in, uh, uh, let's see, cove after cove winding around the island like a ro Rococo oyster shell, the rocky shoals and surf breaks, all the dangerous landing, the landings, the tilted islets, the drowned Anatolian coastal plain and the vo a volcanic extrusion, rocky scrublands and the smell of burning. It's a landscape a little bit like California. An orchard is hung with life jackets. A woman is braiding grass on the verge. Ruined villas, fake garden amphorae, red poppies, orchids, irises, sleeping dogs. Uh, in the inland layered plateau, there's bedrock lichens. The driver's car sick. A creek with little frogs. A prosperous stone village with baby goats. A white mule. Long needle pines above terraced pastures. These are the fellow volunteers who uh, um, had a, a day out, including many of the long-term uh, refugees who also volunteered with us. And uh, the next slide is the what was called the Life Jacket Graveyard. Um, as the boats arrive on the island, uh, the boats are mostly useless. They barely get people there. Uh, and uh, the Life Jackets as well are not certified life jackets. Some of them don't even float. But um, they, they're they glad to shed them on the beach and they get bulldozed into a pile in this side valley. And uh, I think there's a section here. Finally, as the light slants westward, we rumble the gravel road into a tuck valley, an active dump with sorry grounded boats, shepherd's cabins, and some acres of life jackets shredded dinghies. The life jackets, the life jacket graveyard hasn't grown much since last June, the but the arrivals are constant. The late afternoon sky is a churchy ceiling. Two of us are Afghans who actually arrived on these boats and wore these life jackets. One walks to the center of the massive field of orange vinyl and black straps. His camera focusing on the details. The volunteers scatter to the rocky scrub heights where the land belongs to sheep. We sanctify this mess with our presence and the mood is somber. Each life jacket mostly represents lucky survivors. Uh, they're probably, they probably never saved anyone except to give them an, uh, enough confidence to move forward. Ahmed and Majid profess nothing but share hugs anyway. As the sun sets, we're shocked into silence. And back at the foot of the fortified castle wall, we linger through the dark, finally crowding on a narrow terrace wall with pitchers and cups of wine. The Turntable Cafe has a risque Balthus amid the shot glasses, and the DJ is playing a string quartet that slips into the 70s bossa nova. My day stumbles from an extra English class to a garden drawing to a desperate Afghan needing a document sent to his immigra immigration officer. Lunch, glorious chaos, the rice underdone, but the chicken curry spectacular, though we scooped out 700 bowls before we got a taste. The request stacked up. I did portraits, and I translated a secret love letter that needed correction in English the proper wording for Narus, the Persian New Year. And sometimes I just can't do it. Where I'm going, none of you can follow. If I should come back, the ground will have shifted. Who will be here? The fate of my new friends is not, it's too much to contemplate, mainly because of the arduous passage of time, the patient steps to the next summit, which might only be a ridge revealing peaks way beyond Kurdish dancing, any chance to pound out a drum, 
to pound out drum-based music and form a circle and grab a handkerchief, clapping and posing, challenge, showdown, seduction, bonding ritual, and this is all the men. Mock modesty, then cheers as each enters the circle or pairs off into an increasingly closer physical entanglement, just short of an embrace, eyes trained past your partner on the crowd. In a society of men, it is love and combat made safe. There's no wrong move. Clapping hands, the rhythm passes by gesture, winding closer in a spiral. This time, some Afghan women join in, the first time I've seen them with their hair loose of the headscarf. How are we doing? Let's just go a few more minutes here. There's lots and lots. <laughs> On Saturday, a march that commemorates three years of a retrograde agreement between EU and Turkey, allowing refugees to be sent back to Turkey rather than and be defenseless and unsupported. The marchers are Euro hippies and dreadlocked and gentle activists. A few older Greeks, uh, Cookie, anchors a, a banner that proclaims murder in red letters. Uh, a meter high. We suspiciously scan for plain coast police. Arbitrary detention is not unusual even for the volunteers. Refugees risk their status and freedom, even in watching on the sidelines. Our Western, Western freedom comes in flavors, from the fully baked German guarantees to the raw Greek and Turkish rules tinged with unpredictable lap lapses in authoritarianism. So after this, I move on to Samos, another island, uh, and visit the makeshift refugee camp. And uh, I think I'll just talk through a few more of these and close. But um, there's a real contrast, there's a real dissonance between uh, climbing up through these kind of uh, uh, luxury houses built into the slope of the island, and then in the ravine behind is this refugee camp that was built for 400 people and has many thousands living there under tarps and in an area that is eroding mud and uh, slides in the rain. There's all kinds of ways that this safety, this uh, refuge is demeaning. Uh, let's go a little faster, I guess. Some of the kids on the, there's a, a place on Samos on the beach where the kids play soccer. Uh, it's really remarkable to, um, spend time with people, to draw their portraits, uh, people that are so um, optimistic about their lives. I'll just tell, uh, when I was teaching English, I, I was casting around for something sophisticated for uh, advanced English class, and I just happened to have a copy of Mary Oliver's poem in my book, and so I just threw it down on the table. What do you guys think of this? And, uh, and then I realized, to my dread, th about the line, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? And I felt so terrified that I've stepped into something that would, you know, just create pain for other people. And the opposite thing happened. They grabbed onto it and they said, yes, this is exactly what we want to read because we have hopes for our lives. We have plans. Uh, nothing has stopped for us. Uh, let's keep going more. This is uh, the soccer esplanade. And th there was this amazing uh, contrast between um, the, the, the mostly African soccer players and the military who does a parade probably for show every night to raise the, to lower the flag. Uh, and, you know, in the, uh, the kids, they're, they're outrageous. They were uh, marching along and like imitating the soldiers. Uh, next. And you know, so these are the same um, drawing techniques that we'll use, we'll be using in our class this week. Uh, a little watercolor, a little uh, pencil, a little ink drawing. Um, yeah, so. I'll stop there. There's plenty more, but um, it kind of gives you a little flavor of it. So we're going to do a little Q&A.
caution you is just to make sure uh, to wait for Miracle or Sarah to come to you with a mi microphone because we're live um, casting this. Uh, so we want all the people who are watching, the millions who are watching at home to be able to hear your questions. <laughs> so without, with that, does anybody have a question for Mark or Nathan? I, I have one if no one, if uh, for Mark, if no one has one. Um, I'm very interested in the way, I mean, beautiful work, by the way, um, but the way that um, poetry and visual art so often like shares a lot of the same language. And so, you know, things like detail and juxtaposition and framing and composition. So the one of the things that I was really interested in was, was the detail, particularly as you're folding in writing that that is, you know, that's you know, describing things in these crisp and very sensual details, and then the the drawing, painting, sort of like it's all in in uh, in ink work is also sort of like working within that realm as well. So I'm curious about like how you uh, if there's if there's a difference that you can identify between like the way in which you deal with detail when you're doing when you're doing visual work as opposed to when you decide to write something that's in conversation with that work. Well, okay, so um, drawing, if I start from what I know mm -hmm. about drawing, um, the w lessons I learned from drawing is that, and also from cartography, from my experience mapping, is that in order to make information, you have to throw away, in order to make something, uh, in order to make a map, let's say, out of information, you have to throw away 80% of the information. You know, you need a storyline, you need a, a point, you need um, a visual statement that reads. Uh, and, um, and that's this idea of vignetting uh, on a page is, um, is something that I l struggled to learn, but uh, I, I hang on to that, you know. And it's amazing what you can do. This is why I kind of profess that anybody can do this is um, you know as long as you have a clear idea of what what's what's what you're observing what your focus is uh, you don't need to have the skill to capture everything mm -hmm. and you know so in so as one of my friends says well in po in poetry not that I know enough about it to say uh, that the poems that I love, you know, they hinge on just a few words. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe you can uh, speak to that as well. Like, how do you distill language in a poem uh, to, uh, you know, how do you decide what, the, what, what, what needs to be left out? You know? Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because in this particular manuscript, this book that I was, was reading from this evening, um, part of the project was, or at least in some of the poems, was very much about uh, actually, because my first book, most poems didn't take up more than a page. And I think I, I wanted to, I was t teaching a class at the time that was really interested in the long poem because I was curious about what made them work, what made long poems successful, what made anyone pay attention to them or stay with them. Um, I was very much interested in, in that. And I discovered that there really is a kind of generosity that is part of allowing one's, like uh, well, well, extending the utterance to a certain extent. And, and if there are any poets in here who work sort of like in longer form, like I think you recognize the kind of like in as much as there is a discomfort in taking up space, there's also very much a kind of generosity that's also part of sort of like showing more of oneself or at least revealing other facets of, of who you might be. Um, and I was talking actually to my the class a bit earlier and I, I use this quote that I, I constantly think about. Poet, the poet Chris Abani, um, which I think is at your question. Um, Chris Abani, who's just a brilliant poet and thinker um, at the 20th anniversary of the Kave Kahnem retreat, uh, said I was interviewing him as part of a as part of a feature that I was doing for a magazine to talk about some um, a photo essay that he was that he was give, doing and I you know wanted to talk with him about you know his process and he he said a thing to me and in, in sort of in thinking about poetry and thinking about image work in particular he said and it seemed obvious he said a camera no matter how expensive or how great the quality of the camera is purely mechanical. 
Um, and he said, he followed it up with saying, like, a camera doesn't see what you see. A camera only sees what's in front of it. And that our job as writers, our job as artists, is really about not only learning how to frame what we see, uh, but not only learning how to see, but how to frame what we see so that the camera also sees. And so I talked a bit this afternoon about framing in poems. And when you, come, uh, when you think about that question of what's to be left out, um, so much of what ends up needing to be left out of the poem has everything to do with you know, what is, what is it that you discover, the interiority that you want to put on display of the speaker that you've created? Like, what is, what is pulling away from and drawing, you know, it distracting us from that? And what is sort of like pushing us further into it or pushing us more deeply into it? I, I love that you were, use the word generous. It's kind of, ge generous is one of my favorite uh, terms about art. Because, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's minimal art, there's maximal art, but but I have a s this category of what's generous about it. Uh, what when do you feel like you're you're getting a lot? There's richness into what you're getting. That can come from a minimal piece. It can come from a, a very spare uh, line of words. Um, but w one thing that's a big mystery to me is um, w you know in our minds the words maybe the symbols are freighted uh, with all of our history, with all of our experience. And I'm big on like kind of capturing experience and putting it onto the page, but but a lot of times your audience doesn't know your experience. So how do you grapple That's with that? <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I will say that is really great about a, a book of poems for those who actually who end up using them, um, the the n the notes I've found to be really handy. Like if I because I have this middle section in the in the book that is. Once you read the notes, you understand that this is really about my experience as an alternate juror in a New York attempted murder case in 2018. But the poems are so sort of kind of, and I didn't get a chance to read uh, from that particular section, um, but uh, to tonight, but it, you wouldn't necessarily know. I mean, there are some poems that definitely like are more suggestive about that process, but it really is getting at so much of what I experienced in terms of the absurdity of the criminal justice system, and um, and how, like, and and that absurdity comes through in just the various ways in which the poems sort of present themselves. But you wouldn't necessarily know that if I think the notes section really does. I just have a paragraph that just sort of describes that series of poem, all of all of which, and there are 13 of them um, that are all entitled, they said I was an alternate. And it's just really musing on this, like this alternate juror position. Um, for those who don't know, there's always 12 jurors who are picked, selected for the, uh, a case, and then there are three alternates that they will choose. Those three alternates attend all of the proceedings. They listen to all the testimony. They see all the evidence. But when it comes time to deliberate, they are put in another room and don't actually have any any real say in like any of the proceedings in terms of deliberation. I still never found out. They released us early as alternate jurors, maybe two days into deliberation, where we just sat together pretty much in silence. And um, and I still actually, they since they released us early, I've tried to look for it. I actually didn't find out how that case ended. I never could find it. Um, and it's, you know, and so then I think notes really does help. And I think that, um, our subconscious actually, I think, puts more on the page, and there's more inferred on the page through like verb choice, through certain elements of diction. I think there's more on the page that's more revealing about us than even we think that that is there. So even some of the, even the most spare and lyric poems, I think, have so much uh, like narrative gestures in them that we can infer some of the narrative things that are happening, um, even in the midst of something that is that wants to be cryptic, but it's like, I think we just can't help but revealing our, our subconscious in some ways. I don't know if that's like true for the, I mean, you're, you're revealing things clearly, but then in some ways with like the way that you're juxtaposing work, and I'm, and I'm sorry, I know there might be some other questions out here. I know we're just sort of like talking to each other. But, um, but I, I, you know, I, when I think about like the juxtaposition of, of you have an image and then there's text that's sort of over some of the some of the image, and some of the image then therefore obscuring the text. So I'm curious also about like how you think about juxtaposition, like the the of text and image, and also like how important is it that 
what's textual remains clear and readable, or you know, if it's important that some of those lines get kind of blurred? Um, thanks for that question. Um, I kind of like I kind of equate text with texture mm. a bit. I'm not trying to be clever, <laughs> but no, I like that. <laughs> um, y y one thing is that the drawings and the text occur in different time, uh, different time spaces. You know, uh, uh, and and sometimes I have to, uh, you know, actually for me, the drawings, there's this uh, process of observing and translating and controlling your hand and making choices about what ink to use and things. And then the, the visual scene moves on a bit. And that's, it's, it's a struggle. But the words, there's this spigot that turns on words and you have to kind of like turn it down a little bit sometimes. I try not to have too many pages that are all words. So I have an excess of words, and they don't all mean that much. So I sometimes I, I, I like to use them as texture. There was a, a student who was just showing me her, her portraits that are uh, drawn over uh, pages of a book. Um, sorry, I forgot your name, but sh they're, they're really gorgeous portraits. And Another thing I like to do is draw over the tide tables. Oh. <laughs> Stuff like the tide tables is this great information. It's kind of a tracking of time, and w and but it gives you this texture, this really fine grain texture, to draw on top of, mm. and uh, it's beautiful. But and do in and do any of those pieces in the sketchbook or the sketchbook as a whole? Do they end up sort of acting in some ways as like studies towards other? work that you're doing or do or do you feel like what's in a particular sketchbook is sort of its own entity and you like to keep it that way and not like branch out into other projects it really doesn't um, it doesn't branch out I, I, I don't I haven't figured out a way to uh, uh, the, the sketchbooks have become an end in themselves mm. uh, they're they're my uh, my education there is they're a way of walking through the world for me they're my kind of my guidebooks but then I get back into a studio situation and that well okay so here's a good thing we could both talk about is that mm -hmm. contrivance you know you yeah. talk about experience the chickens a lot of that's really direct and in the moment but d do you ever feel like now I need to contrive something because I'm a serious poet and <laughs> and I have to like <laughs> muster the skills and um well I would I would say that um, what ends up being of, I think, of challenge in like in the in the poem, and I've shared this with some of my undergrad students in particular because they, uh, there's uh, especially I don't know if this is true of like at all levels, but especially with undergrads as they're writing poems, they feel uh, intense allegiance to the truth. Like there's an intent, like if it's a, if the party had red balloons, then damn it, I'm gonna put that the it had red balloons. And it doesn't, and sometimes I sit down with students and I ask them, because I, I tell them like, there's a difference between the truth of the event and the truth of the poem. And what the poem requires in terms of how you manipulate the details of the event it, it, may, it may end up better serving your poem. Like what happens if these balloons are green and they are only half inflated and are just sitting, hovering at, you know, at half of everyone's height in the room? Like what happens then? Um, you know, as opposed to them being red and touching the ceiling. You know, this, it's a very different thing that happens two different tonally. different kinds of parties. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, and and both of those types of things, like the 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 speaker who notices these sort of like half floating balloons, like it's it's telling us just as much about their interiority as it is about the the surrounding circumstances, you know, and so trying to help to so that that idea of like contrivance or like what one has to conjure in terms of making making work. Um, it really is, or uh, it it really ends up being something interesting that I'm constantly thinking about, even as I'm drafting my own work. You know, where 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 is the intersection, or where am I having to sort of interface with a kind of artifice that comes with art making, as opposed to you know being able to you know I'm tr I'm trying I think more and more to just to have poems that speak the way that I think. 
um, and that you know, and that are able to express in the way that I am thinking. But it's taken me a long time to get there because you know I'd read so many poets who were very who had a who were very poised and had posture and and who spoke very properly. And I was just like, I don't know if that's a space for me in the in the uh, you know in American letters. And um, but I'm finding more and more like that more and more poets and writers are you know they're just sort of allowing work to come out in ways that, and as we were sort of like talking a little bit beforehand, it's it's really the trick of rhetoric too, right? Like we're, we're presenting something that, we're presenting some sense of the genuine, but what we, are, what we are presenting is also a highly crafted thing. You know, it is a crafted and structured thing. And yet the trick of rhetoric is that we can still somehow present this sense of a real human feeling, thinking voice. I, um so I, I, I dig that, um, especially uh, that there's levels of contrivance. I think it's El Greco that painted a scene of Toledo, and he moved the cathedral over here, you know. <laughs> he wanted to make, <laughs> make it look good, you know. He moved the buildings around, and it's really great paintings. Painting um, uh, That contrivance is actually, well, okay, so the, that makes me think of another question is, you know, you have the rhetorical skills, but wh where does intuition come in? I think intuition comes in, in the, like in the, like especially in the drafting process. And one of the things that I was, I was uh, teaching at another writing conference and I was, you know, going through some poems with some of the participants and they're just really kind of like, uh, you know, they're a bit daunted and a bit intimidated by the poems that were presented. And I have to remind them again and again that like, what we are reading is not a first draft. Like what we are studying here, the poet didn't necessarily, I, like, like nine times out of 10, the poet didn't sit down and this is what came out. Like there are, you know, I was sharing like one, like there was a Bishop poem that we were talking about. I was like, this poem took her 17 years to write. And they're like, 17 years? I'm like, yeah, yeah like she's just, she wrote meticulously and, and this is what it, it, it takes. And so that intuition I think is really, uh, it's like the, the drafting process and what we bring to the drafting process, that, that time we c when we can really let our imaginations run wild and we don't care necessarily that one sentence doesn't, like th one sentence doesn't narratively lead to the next one, but that we're just allowing our imaginations to sort of do its thing. I think that's a lot where that intuition kicks in. And it's also in that place that we start to, like our minds can really begin to, um, to give us like different ways of thinking in terms of syntactical constructions, in terms of sentence variation, in terms of rhythms that start to get created, in terms of like what, what, what our class is talking about, patterns that get set up, and, and you can start to determine where those patterns need uh, to be uh, resisted. I think it's in the revising work and in the work of revision that a lot of, we can make our intention and, and the intention of what's on the page become more apparent to our reader. But I love that sort of like generative uh, state of, and that's it's one of the things that I find, take most pleasure in of what we're doing over the course of this week. We had a chance to just like sit together as a group this afternoon and write. And uh, you know, and we're not we're not necessarily worried about the things that we're sharing out at the end being polished and ready to go to Poetry Magazine. We're just mostly we're mostly just interested in the fact that we're able to get down some ideas that are interesting enough for us to want to pr continue to pursue and 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 suss out. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, I actually treasure. There's a, there's a thing that happens sometimes with an image where you think you're working on this and then something grabs you out of the corner of your eye, something peripheral grabs you and you go, well maybe that's what I'm actually working on. Yeah. And sometimes that happens with a painting where uh, I'll just be like tired and done. <laughs> and I'm like, what about this? And then I come back the next day and it's like, everyone's like, well that's what you're doing. <laughs> this stuff, you're working, you're trying too hard over here. And do you ever find out that there are, are times when what you are, or is there ever like the impulse that what you are, you know, sometimes writing, and I think I was seeing this in some of what you were, pre were presenting, in what you write um, is sort of presenting something that's in tension or in conflict with what you have created in terms of the image and like what, you know, what ends up sort of driving the impulse to kind of like put together these two things that are resisting one another. For sure, you know, I think I, I'm drawn to like the picturesque a little bit. 
and that doesn't doesn't tell the story sometimes. Uh, so there is there's a, there's a, there is a lot of kind of dissonance in the sketchbooks between the imagery and and sometimes you can't well when you're telling somebody else's story it's difficult to be authentic <coughs> and um, you know so I'm constantly going back to what's my authentic experience in that place and uh, and you you know I can never. Uh, completely tell someone else's story, you know, that's my other, was a friend just told me, you know, y the best thing to do is ask me. Don't try to tell my story, just ask me, <laughs> you know. And uh, I think that's what we want, something we all need to know. Yeah. and Nathan will be signing their books at the back of the room, so check it out. And also be sure to join us tomorrow for another great event featuring writer Julia Glass, artist Forrest Williams, and printmaker Simonet Kwamina. So be sure to join us tomorrow. Thank you again to Mark and Nathan.